Okay, we're, welcome to the book of Genesis on our word study of repent slash repentance. We are going to turn to Genesis chapter 6, going to go through verse 1 through verse 8. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw their daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And we see that today a lot. Verse 6, And it repented, there's our word, the Lord, that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, Remember the intro study, we went over a lot of definitions. Now, definition number four is what applies here. Apply to a supreme being to change the course of providential dealings. Now, you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. Let's head to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through Twenty-six, first Gen uh, Genesis chapter one, twenty-six. And God said, "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth." So God created man in His own image, and the image of God created He him. Male and female created He them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, also, if you go back far enough, uh, go down, jump down to verse 31. And God saw everything that, thing that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So there's two parts there. God created man, and he said it was good. And he also told man to multiply on the face of the earth. Now when it comes to a supreme being to change the course of provincial dealings, when he's dealing with man at the beginning, multiply. Okay? It is good. Creating man was good. Now before the flood, when he saw how the world was, his, how he was dealing with the world changed. Now he regrets making man. It's, he repents. Okay, It's no longer good that he made man. He feels like it's bad that he made man because of how e uh, um, evil they were. Plus, he's going to destroy him. He went from multiplying him to, I'm going to destroy all of them off the face of the earth. But Noah found grace in God's eyes. So the context of repentance here is the change, the course of provincial dealings. God is dealing with the world one way before the flood, before you know, he asked Noah to build the ark, and he's going to deal with the world differently when the flood starts. He kills everybody except Noah, his three sons, and his three sons' wives, and Noah's wife. Okay? So that's the context here. It goes from, it's good that man was created, to now it's bad. It went from being fruitful and multiplied, to I will destroy man whom I have created. It's a change of providence. When God repents, it's a change in how he's going to deal with people. He's going to say, I'm going to do this, 
and he repents, and he's not going to do it. He's going to deal with them a different way. And we'll see that when we get to Exodus. So, only one time was repent found in the book of Genesis. So, we'll see you in the next book. Okay, repent and repentance for the book of Exodus. Turn to chapter 13 of Exodus. We're going to start Exodus 13, turned right, almost right to it. Uh, verse 17 and 18. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Let's peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. So we see here, repentance falls under definition 3, to change the mind and consequence of inconvenience or injury done. What's going on here, and I'll do a map, I'll go through a map with you guys after this. If you look at the map, the straightest line for the longest time, and we'll, I'll get to the map and talk to you guys about it, but bottom line, God didn't want the Jewish people to go into war with the Philistines and have them repent and basically say that we shouldn't have left Egypt. Okay, We should not have left Egypt, we need to go back to Egypt. Okay, Getting away from Egypt for good is what they're supposed to do, and they, God didn't want them repenting of that. Saying, okay, it's not good to be out of Egypt, we're going to go back to Egypt. So, after this I'll show you the map. So, we'll go there. All right. The thing is, is what they're talking about, what we just read, is going from here, Sokoth, down to here, Etham, down to Migdol, across, that's where they cross, to Balzaphon, and then down to Mount Sinai. Okay. The, uh, some people say they came farther north, or south, I'm sorry, came farther south, but the point is, is the the way they traveled, the way God wanted them to, so they didn't go off in any direction where they'd run into people where they would war with, because God didn't want them repenting of coming out of Egypt, changing their minds, saying, you know, we're going back to Egypt. Leaving Egypt's good, it's great, and then they changed their mind, that we want to go back to Egypt. So that was the whole point. God had it planned out so they wouldn't repent and go back to Egypt. So... Okay, the next place in Exodus that has repentance, the word repent, is Exodus 32. So we're going to go to Exodus chapter 32, verse 7. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, I, I, I think you should have your Bibles on you. Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for, the, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sanctified thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Okay. Right here we've got, I'm going to jump ahead and let you know, it has to do with, uh, once again, to change the course of prudential dealings. This is what God's going to do. Okay. Now Moses is going to plea that God you know, changes his providence, that he doesn't do that. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thou wrath, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt? It's a little windy out here. So I'll be pausing sometimes. With great power and with a mighty hand. 
Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did, the, did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and, and Israel. Remember your name's no longer Jacob, but Israel. Thy servants, to whom thou warst by thine own self, and saddest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars in heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and, thy, and they shall inherit it forever. So this is Moses pleading with them. Okay. Verse 14, after Moses pleads for Israel, what does God do? And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. And we're going to find out here in a second what, what he changed his providence to. So he was going to destroy all the Jewish people except for Moses. And he was going to start all over with Moses. Because Moses is of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Moses pleads with him saying, please don't do this, Lord. So the Lord... Here's Moses is pleased, and he changes his providence. What's God going to do instead? And Moses turned, let's get 15. Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testament were in both hands. Actually, let's jump down. Sorry, I was, we can read all that, but jump down to verse 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Okay, this is God, Lord, uh, saying this is how he's changing his providence, how he's going to deal with the people. Put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from the gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. God, when God repents, it's not that he sinned, it's he's changing his providence, how he's going to deal with something. First, he said, I'm going to destroy everybody, and I'm going to start all over with Moses. Moses pleads with him, Lord, please don't do that. The Lord repents. What's that repent? Repentant. Or what's that repent? He's saying, okay, I won't kill everybody. But still, 3,000 people died. This is how God chose to deal with it. It's a change in how God's going to deal with something. That's what it means when God repents. doesn't mean that he's a sinner. You have a lot of people who fight repentance as part of salvation, because if it's repentance as part of salvation, then when God repents, it's saying he's a sinner. No, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's talking about a change in providence, how he's going to deal with the situation. Okay. So those are the only two times that repent is mentioned in the book of Exodus. So we'll see you in the next one. Okay, welcome back. Uh, repent slash repentance, the book of Numbers. It's only mentioned once in the book of Numbers. You'll turn to chapter 23, verse 19. That's where we're going to start. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? For hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Repent here is, falls under definition number five. In theology, to sorrow or be pained for sin. Okay. He's saying that he's, God's not a liar. He's not a sinner. Notice it said there that he should lie, neither the son of man, that he should repent. We are born into a world of sin. We are sinners. We have to repent. Okay? He's saying um, 
dishonor, this is trying to save people. You look at the New Testament, they keep trying to make Jesus out to be a liar. These new Bible perversions make Jesus out to be a liar, and if he lies, he's a sinner, and if he's a sinner, he's not God. And that's what's going on here. God is not a liar. If he says he's going to do something, he's going to do something. If he says he's not going to do something, he's not going to do it. Um, back in Exodus, you know, we came across the, his providence. He, he's still punished. If you remember when he was talking to Moses, I believe when he said he's going to kill everybody and start all over with Moses, I've had people tell me that, ah, oh, he was just testing Moses. But right here we see that it says, Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? If Moses failed that test, I believe God would have destroyed Israel and started all over with Moses. If God said he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He's not a liar. So, you've got to remember that the context here, notice it says, Romans chapter 3, verse 4, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Notice it said that God is not a man that he should lie. The repentance here is talking about how we, as sinners, repent because we are sinners. When we lie, we repent. Whether it's to God, we still should repent to God, but we repent to the people we lie to. I've said this before. If I lie to somebody, I say, I am sorry for lying. And that's what this is right here. Sorry, sorrow or, or be pained for sin. I am sorry that I lied to you. And when you say that, you're admitting that you lied and you understand the consequences of lying. That's what we do. God is not a liar. So context here, definition number five, to sorrow or be pained for sin. God's not a liar, so he doesn't have to have sorrow or be pained because he's not a sinner. So, book of Numbers, only mentioned one time. We'll see you in the next book. Okay, Repent and Repentance, the book of Deuteronomy. Okay. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're going to start in verse 31. For their rock, lowercase r, for their rock is not as our rock, capital R, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and the field of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of dragons and their cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. And the thing that shall come upon them make haste, for the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants, when he seeth that their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods? their rock in whom they trusted, which did, which did eat the fat of the sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. Okay. We're going to keep going there, but repentance. Okay, you repent himself for his servants. Number 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me, I kill, lowercase g God, in other words, there's only one God. I kill make, and make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hands. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrow drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives, from the beginning of revenge upon the enemy, beginnings of revenge upon the enemy. 
Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, avenge the blood of his servants, and will render vengeance to his adversaries, and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Okay? This goes back to definition number four, you know, to change the course of provident provincial dealings, I believe. The people obey the Lord, put away false gods, God's going to be good to them and bless them. They bring in false gods, God's not. But more importantly, this is talking about the enemies, the pagans, okay? God lets them be. Uh, they're going to get punished. Remember it said right here, um, can we find it again, Lord? The day of their calamity, there it is, uh, verse 35, for the day of their calamity is at hand. They're going to get their punishment. I'm not saying God's not going to punish them, but on that spot, God's not going to punish them. But when they come against the people of Israel, His providence changes. He goes from letting them be, and they'll get theirs, their day of calamity's coming, to, I'm going to punish them right now. Vengeance is mine. Okay, Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We just read there, vengeance is the Lord's. He will deal with them. Mm -hmm. So it's a change of providence. As long as they leave the Jewish people alone, they're, they're going to go to hell, but God's not going to be dealing with them because God's dealing with the Jewish people. They come against the Jewish people. Now, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He's going to deal with them. It's a change of providence. Okay. Let's go back to where the word was again. Here it is, verse 36. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants. Okay. Judge his people. That's for the people who bring in false gods. He's going to repent that he made him servants, I believe, and he's going to put up new servants. Get rid of the old, bring in new that are good. Uh, the, do worship capital G God, not lowercase g gods. Capital R rock, not lowercase r rock. He's going to punish the people, that w the pagan people that worship their false gods, and anytime they mess with Israel. Vengeance is the Lord. Providence of dealing. When he repents, he's talking about how he's going to deal with people. First, he's, he's, being, he's blessing Israel. They turn to false gods. You read this throughout here. They turn to false gods. He's punishing them. I will bless you. Now I'm going to punish you. I'm going to change from that blessing to punishing you. Uh, you have kings that put away all the false gods. Uh, they leave up the high places. Then you have some that tear down the high places. And God go, changes from punishing them to blessing them. The change of providence. That's what repent means. You know, when the Lord repents. So... That's it for Deuteronomy. It was only mentioned once, so I'll see you in the next one. Remember, God, when He repents, just because part another definition of repent is sorrow for sinning, doesn't mean that God's a sinner because He repents. It means He's changing what how He's going to deal with people. Okay, let them be the lost world. They've got what's coming to them, and focus on the saved. In this position, it's talking about the Jewish people, and when they come against the Jewish people, now he has to change. He has to deal with them differently. Instead of letting them be, he's going to punish those lost people. Jewish people, blessings. They turn against God, bring in false gods. Punishment. He changes his dealings, his providence. Okay, it's how he deals with things. How God chooses to deal with things. So, that's it for Deuteronomy. I'll see you in the next one. Next video. Next book. <laughs> Okay, welcome back to Repent slash Repentance Word Study. Uh, this one's going to be on the book of Judges. So if you want to turn to Judges chapter 2, we're going to start at verse 1. So, uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 17. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum, 
and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars. But ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Now if you read before, God promised to drive out all the inhabitants of the land that's promised to the Jewish people. The twelve tribes. Okay, He promised to drive them all out. But Israel didn't. Where, verse 3, Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as a thorn in your side, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. Remember this. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord, capital L, Lord, spake these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of the place Bokim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the day of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Remember this. Joshua saw the amazing work that the Lord did for Israel. Even getting coming out of uh, Egypt, the uh, when they wandered in the wilderness, and Joshua leading the people to take all the land of the inhabitants to the twelve tribes. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being a hundred and ten years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance, in Timoth Timoth hears in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gash. Some of these names I know, some of them I'm guessing. Uh, verse 10, And also all the generations were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. Now, if you stop there for a second, can we apply that to today? Uh, what God did for America, what God did for Christians, uh, Christianity, you know, when the King James Bible came out, going all over the world with missionaries, uh, the Word was getting out, the Gospel was getting out, uh, revival, people living right, doing right, and after generation after generation, look at today. Nobody wants anything to do with the King James Bible. Nobody wants anything to do with living right according to God's Word. Our nation's corrupt. Uh, other nations are corrupt. We're getting closer and closer to the end. Sodomy's running rampant. And uh, we'll get into that here later. Uh, sodomy's running rampant. Um, sexual perversion. Um, feeding the flesh. I mean, everything has gotten so bad, generation after generation forgets about the previous generation. And they think they know how to do things better, and they do things their way, and everything falls apart. Verse 12, And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers. The other thing is today, how many false gods are out there today? Okay, False gods are everywhere. False Jesus, antichrists are everywhere. Back to uh, 12. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, lowercase g gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them. Got to stay focused on this. God was going to help them drive out all the people around them, but they didn't. And what happened because they didn't? They were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. They brought in false gods from them. In the New Testament talks about how we're not to fellowship with the lost world. Why? I believe part of it, a big part of it, is this right here. You start fellowshipping with the lost world, these Babel buildings inviting lost people in, you're inviting Satan in. False gods. You're inviting wickedness in. 
And that's why the Bible commands us that we're not to be unequally yoked with the lost world. Amen. Verse 13, And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. 14, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hand of their enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. 15. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. These are the two key verses along with uh, verse 3. Wouldn't drive the people out like he promised. This is when we get to the repentance, it's a change in providence. And these two verses right here, 14 and 15, letting those people um, deliver them into the hands of spoilers that spoil them, sold them into the hands of their enemies, verse 14, round about. Verse 15, uh, the Lord said, let's see, whosoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. Okay. Now, 16, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hands of those that spoiled them. We'll find out why he lifted up judges. 17, And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods, and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandment of the Lord, but they did not so. Okay. Verse 18, 18 and 19 is where we want to get to. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judges and delivered them out of the hands of their enemies all the days of the judges. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. He said that he was going to let those inhabitants that they wouldn't drive out come in and do bad things to them. Verse 19, And it came to pass... When the judges were was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers, in following the gods, lowercase g gods, to serve them and to bow down unto them, they cease not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn ways. So repentance here is a change of providence. Uh, definition number four. Um, he was going to drive them all out. Now he's not going to drive them all out. So they come in, he's going to allow them to come in, and they're going to deliver them to the hands of spoilers that spoil them, and to be sold into the hands of their enemies round about. But through all this punishment that's going on, God repents, because he made judges. And it's funny that, uh, and when the judges were there judging them, and telling Israel, you're to obey God, they, they don't always hearken to their judges, but it says here that delivered them out of the hands of their enemies all the days of the judges. So there's a change in providence where you're always going to be in the hands of the enemies. Well, now I'm going to make judges so they can deliver you out of the hands of the enemies. So a change in providence. And the biggest thing, if you go to chapter 3, we're going to read a few verses, starting at verse 1. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel from them. So he left people in the heavens to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the, the generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war that the least such a, that at the least such as before knew nothing thereof, namely five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites and the Sidians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lib Libyan, from Mount Behoman unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Okay. Repentance was based primarily, in this context, off of God just going to say, I'm going to let them just, you know, terrorize you basically, the inhabitants and screw you up because you wouldn't drive them out and you made deals with them and you brought in their false gods and started worshiping false gods. 
But part of it also you realize is that he was going to drive all the inhabitants out of the land, and now he's not because they didn't drive them out. Um, they didn't drive all the inhabitants. They left some of them there making deals with them and bringing in false gods. God's like, okay, at this point, I'm not going to drive them out anymore. I'm going to leave these four here to prove you. So that is the context of repent in Judges chapter 2, verse 18. Now we're going to jump over to Judges. This is going to be a long one. we got to get in context. And the wind is out today. I hope it's not affecting the camera. We're going to go to Judges 19. We're going to read 15 through 30. Okay, you have a traveler that's traveling, and we're going to start at uh, verse 15. And they're in Gibeah, that's owned by the uh, tribe of Benjamin. Verse 15, And they turned aside thither to go in and lodge in Gibeah, and when he went in, he sat him down in a street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house, to lodging. 16. And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, even, which was also of Mount Ephraim, and he sojourned in Gibeah. But the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he had lifted, when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city, and the old man said, Whither goest thou? And whence comest thou? And he said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, towards the side of the Mount Ephraim. From thence am I, and I went to Bethlehem, Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord, and there is no man that receiveth me to house. Yet there is both straw and provender for our asses, and there is bread and wine also for me and for thy handmaid. And for the young man which is with thy servants, there is no want of anything. And the old man said, Peace be with thee, howsoever, let all thy wants lie upon me. Only lodge not in the street. Now if you can look back to Sodom and Gomorrah, what did... Um, my brain freezes sometimes. Uh, lot. Uh, what did Lot say to the angels? He had he kept pressing on him, pressing on him, do not um, uh, lodge in the streets, because they were going to stay in the streets all night. And it's funny, because we're going to get into this, about it's, it's taught, stories talking about sodomy, and it's talking about rape. And the street corners is where you find, you know, back in the day you found uh, prostitutes on the street corners, a lot of bad things would happen on the streets, to men and women uh, when you're out at night when they're supposed to be at home. So he's saying, you know, do not lodge in the streets. Verse 21, So he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Bilia, Biliel, they set the house round about, and beat at the door, and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. Talking about sodomy. So sodomy was going on in Israel at this time, with uh, among the Benjamites. Verse 23, And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them, and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is come into mine house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, and maid, and his concubine, the concubine of the man that was visiting, 
Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. Okay. Sodomy is an abomination in the sight of God. And out of all sexual perversion, it's the worst. Period. And America has welcomed sodomy in with open arms. And that's why this country, I believe, is one of many reasons they turn their back on the book, which is the number one reason, and they start inviting wicked sin in, sodomy being a big one. Verse 25, But the men would not hearken to him, so the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning, and when the day began to spring, they let her go. Basically, I know these are tough words for some people, they raped her. Verse 26, Then came the woman in the dawning of the day, and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was, till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning, and opened the doors of the house, and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hand was upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, and let us be going. But none answered. She was dead. Then the man took, up, took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up and got him unto his place. We're going to find out later that, yes, sodomy is an abomination, and it is wicked, and God deals so harshly. Read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, but we're going to find out that God deals harshly with rape as well. Verse 29, And when he was come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into twelve pieces and sent her unto all the coast of Israel. And it was so that all that saw it said, There was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak ye your minds. Just speak your minds. We read this to get in context to know what's going on, what Israel's response is, and why the word repent is being used. So, we know the wicked, wicked deed that was done here. Turn to, actually, this is the next chapter, chapter 20, we're going to read verse 13. Now, Israel, as you read through here, Israel gets an army together, the other 11 tribes get together, and they're outside this city that they're in, and they're telling them, we're going to read it here real quick, uh, verse 13, Now therefore deliver us the men, the children of Belial, I keep butchering that word, Belial is what I want to say, but I think it's Belial, which are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. Okay, They went in to this city and said, hey, give us the people who did the wicked crime. Okay, A party wants to look at this like God being a righteous judge and having Israel do right. They're not going to kill everybody because not everybody committed this wicked deed. Maybe they didn't know about these people doing the wicked deed. So they just said, Give us the people that are guilty. We're, we're not going to kill everybody. We just want the people that are guilty. Here's their response. But the children of Benjamin would not hearken to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. I believe at this point, they became responsible for the sins of those people, um, the children of Belial. They, became, they knew about it. At this point, I believe they knew about it and they were sheltering them and trying to defend them for this wicked sin that they did. They became as guilty as they were, and now they're going to be held accountable to the same punishment as they are. So, 14, But the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities unto Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at the time out of the cities twenty and six thousand men that drew swords besides the inhabitants of Gibeah, which were numbered 700 chosen men. Now, as you read through here, 
you're going to read through here the study of uh, how the war was done. They sent in a group of people to fight. They, they failed against Benjamin, and they fled, and they asked God, should we send a group up again? And they did, only the second time they had a group on the, let's say they had a group over here to the right side of the city hiding, and then they sent a group to the city and said, hey, go fight with them a little bit and then act like you're, basically act like you're fleeing. So the second time the Benjamins came out, pride got the better of them and they're saying they're fleeing like they did the first time, let's chase them down. So they went, left the city and started chasing that army down and the army over here that was hidden, Victoria, the army over here that was hidden they snuck in and destroyed the city. They killed everything in the city. Everyone in the city, every animal. They put the city aflames. They destroyed it utterly. And the Benjamites, when they turned and looked back and saw that their city was on fire, they stopped chasing the army and turned to start, to start coming back. And that's when the army here of the Israels, the other 11 tribes, jumped on them and pounced on them and started uh, destroying them. Uh, jumped down to 46. Verse 46, so that all which fell that day of Benjamin were twenty and five thousand men that drew the sword, all these were men of valor. Now notice, it doesn't include the city. This doesn't include the number of everybody they destroyed in the city. This has to do with those that came out to fight in war. Actually, you know what, it probably is both. I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. Both. But 40, verse 47, because it says in that day. I mean, I'm the one that always saying words have meaning, but in that day. Uh, but 600 men turned and fled to the wilderness unto the rock Rimeon and abode in the rock Rimeon four months. So out of 26,000 men, 25,000 plus a little bit more, but 25,000 men were killed. For two reasons, because they would not give up the men, the men who deserved to die were the men that actually committed the bad, wicked deed, and they wouldn't give them up. So those men were supposed to come out and die, so the wicked deeds was the reason there was death was warranted, punishment was death, and the reason so many of them had to die was because they condoned it. There was nothing wrong with it, we're going to defend these men, there's nothing wrong with what they did. So they all took on the penalty for the few people that did it. The whole city, the whole tribe of Benjamin got punished. For, uh, 600 men survived. That's how much God takes that seriously. He takes rape just as serious as he takes sodomy. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to get to the part with repentance in it. So turn to Judge 21.6. So we have set... Oops, 21.6. We've set the scene, as they say, to get the context. So we know the wicked deed that was done. We know the punishment that they had to endure. Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, is almost wiped out. There's only 600 left. So verse 6. And the children of Israel repented them for Benjamin, their brother, and said, There is one tribe cut off from Israel this day. So they look at what they did, and it was just, but they, repentance here, um, definition number three, to change the mind and consequence of the inconvenience or injury done by past conduct. So instead of wiping them out completely, because they could have gone and wiped out the last 600 people, killed them. But they repented. They changed, saying, you know what, we need a 12th tribe. Mm -hmm. There's one tribe cut off from Israel today. So jump down to 15, we're going to read 15 through 17. We're going to read, they're going to repent again, showing how they're not going to wipe them out like they had planned. They changed their mind, but also what they did to save that tribe. Verse 15, and the people repented them for Benjamin, because that the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. Then the elders of the congregation said, How shall we do for wives for them that remain, seeing the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? 
And they said, There must be an inheritance for them that be escaped of Benjamin, that a tribe be not destroyed out of Israel. Verse 18, we're going to keep going. Howbeit we may not give them wives of our daughters, for the children of Israel have sworn, saying, Cursed be he that giveth a wife to Benjamin. Then they said, Behold, there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh yearly, and a place which is on the north side of Bethel, on the side, east side of the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem, Shechem and on the south of Lebanon. Therefore they commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyards, and, and see, and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in dances, then come ye out of the vineyards, and catch you every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh, and go to the land of Benjamin. So, they repented, change of mind, of consequence. They went from, I'm going to wipe them out, to, okay, we don't want to wipe them out. We want to keep the inheritance going that the Lord had promised. Um, so they made a way for them to have wives, so the tribe of Benjamin gets to keep going. So I put definition number three, to change the mind and consequence of inconvenience or injury done by past conduct. The injury is we're going to lose a tribe, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So um, thank you for watching. Uh, those are the context. Once again, the first one. Uh, when the Lord repents, it doesn't mean He sinned. There are times when we repent, it doesn't mean we're sinning. It means we're going to change our mind. We're going to do something, and we realize the consequences, so we decided, you know, we're not going to do it. And then there's repentance when it comes to, hey, we're sinning, we're living in wicked sin, and we need to repent to God, acknowledging that we're sinning against Him, and we don't want His wrath on us. Okay? And then there's re biblical repentance, which is, I'm realizing repentance is a, as a New Testament word. It might still be in the Old Testament. We're going to keep going and find out. And I'm doing these studies book by book as we go through together. So the terms in here, we got the context of repentance. I'll see you guys, my brothers and sisters, in the next video. Okay, welcome back to our next uh, set of videos for Repent and Repentance. And today, it's going to be on 1st and 2nd book of Samuel. So if you want to go to 1st Samuel 15, chapter 15, verse 1 is where we're going to start. In this chapter, repent is used three times. Make sure I got that correct. You ever get things up and then you start to doubt yourself, so I just want to make sure. So one, two, three times, and then one time in 2nd Samuel. But... 1 Samuel 15, verse 1. And we're going to go through it together. Samuel also said unto Saul, King Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the word of the Lord. Um, i got to throw in there real quick uh, with all the deception that's going on with all the major doctrines, with the Bible version issues. How many people are not hearkening unto the, the voice of the word of the Lord. Um, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which is Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now notice it says him in the way in verse 2. It's talking about Israel. Verse 4. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in, in Telaim. 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Canaanites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Canaanites departed from them among the Amalekites. Now, context, the reason we started first is Saul has been commanded by God to wipe out the Amaleks utterly, everything. 
verse 7, And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah unto, until thou comest to shore that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. Was he commanded to take him alive or to utterly destroy everybody? Utterly destroy everybody. And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatling and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, Here's the first time it's used, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So, we see here repentance. Repenteth. It's... Um, has to do with the change in providence, and you'll see why here in a, in a bit. Um, applied to a supreme being to change the course of providential dealings. Uh, we'll get to verse 28. But right now he repented that Saul, he made Saul king. Now God knows the future. He knew it was going to happen. So this repentance here is a change in providence. What did he do? We'll find out later. I'll jump ahead a little bit. He takes the um, the kingdom from Saul and gives it to his neighbor, Dave, King David. So it's a change in providence. God chose Saul to be king. Then he's like, no, I'm taking the kingdom from you. You're no longer going to be king, and I'm going to give it to David. And then later on, as you read through the story of uh, David, what he went through and then became King David. So... Verse 12, that's the first time it's mentioned. Verse 12, And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgad. Gal. And Samuel came to Saul, and, set, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears? He was to destroy everything, and he didn't. And the lowering of the oxen which I hear. It's getting cold out here. Um, verse 15, And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. I don't know if that means anything, but he says the Lord thy God talking to Samuel. Uh, so saying that to sacrifice unto the God of Israel, our God, my God, it's thy God. I don't, I don't know if that means anything. 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will till thee what the Lord hath said unto me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord, Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then... A little windy. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. So basically, he was going off of what he wanted in his own interpretation of what he thought God wanted instead of just listening to his word and obeying his word. I honestly believe he thought he was doing right. And he wasn't. 
21, But the people took of the spoil, sheep, and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And so now he's blaming the people. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You know how people are holding on to the Trinity and not letting go of men's words, pagan philosophy? Um, just had to throw that in there real quick. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Um, how many times, I mean, I remember doing the uh, courageous man or foolish man about Adam and Eve, and when God basically confronted Adam, Adam, I joked about it because it's the truth, but Adam blamed everybody except himself. He didn't take responsibility. He blamed his wife, Eve, and he blamed God for, you know, it's this woman you created for me. So he basically blamed both of them. Um, but he feared the people and obeyed their voice. When you heed the voice, especially online with all these false converts and false um, preachers, or the pressure, you're in a certain group, social club, and everybody's saying this is how it is, uh, you do well to heed the word of the Lord and not the voice of the people. Okay? Be not conformed to this world. Okay? Be not, don't be a friend to the world either. Verse 25, Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. Remember, God looks at the heart. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. The change in providence. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Change in providence. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Actually, three verses but four times uh, that repent is used in 1 Samuel. But right here it's talking about um, to sorrow or be pained for sin. Once again, uh, the strength here is a capital S on strength of Israel. Who's your strength today? Is it in your flesh? Is it in insurance? Is it in thing, things of this world? Who's your strength today? should be Jesus Christ. So I believe here it says, and also the strength of Israel, it's talking about Jesus Christ. He is the rock. Will not lie nor repent. Lie. Isn't lie a sin? And if he repents of lying, that makes Jesus a sinner. Makes God, Jesus who is God, a sinner. For he is not a man that he should repent. We as men sin. Now I understand people say, well it says that for he is not a man. Like I said, this is the Godhead, the mystery of godliness. Um, it's talking about God, and like I said, the strength when you find out in the, in the New Testament that uh, Jesus is a man, but he's also God manifest in the flesh. That's a whole other uh, videos I've already done and brothers, sisters in Christ, brothers in Christ have done. But here, I put down for repent both times, it has to do with um, sin. God's not a sinner. Mm -hmm. God told him to do something, he didn't do it. God says up here that he's going to rend the kingdom from them. God's not a liar. It's, it's, it's uh, Samuel saying it's going to happen. Period. God's not a liar. 
God can change His providence, absolutely. But here it's saying that God is not going to change. He's not lying. That he's, you are going to lose the kingdom and He's going to give it to somebody else. And did it happen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Verse 30, Then He said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. Uh, boy, was he wrong. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childish, so, thy show, <laughs> so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agai in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Samuel obeyed the Lord. Saul did. Then Samuel went to Raham, uh, Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to, to Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Once again, change in providence. Okay? How he's going to do something. God said, I want Saul to be king. Saul screwed up big time. And God's like, okay, change in providence. You're no longer going to be king. The repentance here is not that God sinned. And so far, we're going through this together. I'm not just going through the whole thing hardcore. We're doing uh, book by book together as we go through this and so far from my studies repentance has nothing to do with an action uh, uh, like cleaning your life up an action can happen before repentance an action can happen after repentance but the actual repentance part happens in the heart when God uh, repents he changes his providence I'm doing it this way now I'm going to do it that way so, those are four times in three verses that repent is used in 1 Samuel. Let's turn to 2 Samuel 24, verse 9. 2 Samuel 24, verse 9. Twenty-four, verse nine. Now, what happens in the uh, verse chapter twenty-four? It's King David. It says here in verse one, if you want to look over there for this. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and He moved David against them to say, "Go number Israel and Judah." So, King David numbers the people, and the whole point of this is God is your strength. You don't, you know. Oh, I got this insurance, I got that insurance, you know, start counting your wealth, start counting, you know, how strong you are, or the strength of the things you have. Um, you're supposed to trust in the Lord, and the Lord's supposed to be your strength. Um, here, King David is asking him to number the people so he can see how strong Israel is. So we're going to verse 9. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto king, unto the king. And there was in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. Having your heart right with the Lord, that's why King David was called a man after God's own heart. When you fall into sin and temptation, it's that heartfelt conviction um, that means everything. I've come across so many professing Christians that don't have that heartfelt conviction. They don't have that attitude. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done, and that I have done, and now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Remember the study I did on, uh, we just talked about in the last video, 
uh, prayer and testimony video, um, iniquity, if you hold iniquity in your heart, God will not hear you. Is King David holding the iniquity in his heart? No, he's saying, take away the, the iniquity of thy servant. And that verse is in uh, Psalms. For I have done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things, choose three of three, choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. Sorry for my reading today. 13. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in the land, in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while thy, they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. Praise the Lord. And let me not fall into the hand of man. A lot of us can testify how great God's mercy is. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba 70,000 men. Here's the verse with the word repent. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of, I'm probably going to mess this up, Aronai, Arona, Arona, Aruna, the Jebusite. Okay, right here I put down um, change in providence. Because if you look up here, so, so the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed, three days. Now, the Lord was going to destroy the city, and the change of providence, he's going to stop. Okay. The Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, it is enough. Change in providence, someone can say it's a change of mind, but if you look at the definition of the change of mind, it's for something past, and he's saying he's repenting on the spot, saying it's enough. Stop, it's enough. So that's why I said change in providence. It's not something that happened in the past when it comes to the change of mind. It's something that's present. It's happening right now. God's like, okay, stop, it's enough. Change in providence. He could have let it go. He let it, could let it keep going. Because uh, no, it says until the time appointed. Um, he could have, instead of doing the full three days, because you read this, I know it says even to the time appointed, and it says about three days of pestilence, but could God have stopped it early? He said, okay, it's enough. It's enough. No more. That's enough. Change in providence. Because it doesn't say three days. It says the time appointed. Who appoints the time? God does. He said he wanted it done for three days. And if that's the case, the Lord here would have stopped at the end of three days. Okay, it's the third day, he's going to stop. He wouldn't have need uh, the angel of the Lord, uh, God, the Father, and the Lord here. Remember, it's capital L, lowercase o-r-d, and there's only one Lord that's a capital L Lord, lowercase o-r-d, Jesus Christ. So the Father is telling Jesus Christ, it's enough. So I believe he didn't go the full three days. Israel was suffering so great that it didn't go the full three days. God said, I repented of this evil. It's enough. So as we can see here, it's a change in providence. Change in providence. So four times repentance was mentioned in 1 Samuel and one time in 2 Samuel. So... Thank you for following along. Like I said, so far, when God repents, He's, it's not, he, he's not sinning when He repents. Change in providence. Okay? Uh, like I said, some people like to say change of mind. Um, but like I said, a change of mind has to do with something in the past. Uh, a lot of times when you read about 
of repentance. Sometimes, like when we just talked about Saul, someone can make the argument that repentance could also, you know, twofold meaning where it's also his past that he made Saul king. It's talking about the past, a change of mind. But the providence, change of providence is there also because he's, he, his punishment. He wanted Saul to be king. Um, I believe until the day he died. I mean, he knows the future, but he made him king. And he's supposed to be king until the day he dies. But God took that away from him. So, and gave it to King David, uh, uh, David, and he became king. So thank you for following me on this study. We'll continue through these books and get through them. Uh, there's some great stories that I've read already about repentance. And uh, I'm going to get back to doing some more, just trying to get really back into the studies. So thank you for listening. I'll see you in the next video. Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome back to another Repent Repentance Word Study. Today we're going to do the book of Kings, Chronicles, and Job. Okay? If you want to turn to 1 Kings chapter 8, and we're going to get started. I'm going to try to knock these out. We're going to start in verse 46. And we're going to read all the way through 52. Starting 46, if they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, no, there's none righteous, no, not one, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the, the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy far or near, yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land, whether they were carried captive, and repent, and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive, saying, We have sinned, and have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. And as so returned unto thee with all their heart, and with all their soul, in the land of their enemy, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee towards their land, which thou gavest unto their father, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. Uh, stop there for a second, just remember uh, Daniel how he's always praying toward, towards Jerusalem and Babylon. 49, because this is what it's talking about. Uh, this is the whole thing, we'll get to it. 49, then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven thy dwelling place and maintain their cause. And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee and give them compassion before them who carried them captive and they may have compassion on thee. For they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt, from the midst of the furnace of iron, that thine enemies may be open unto the supplication of thy servants, and unto the supplication of thy people Israel, to hearken unto them in all that they call for unto thee. Uh, basically this is asking, at the time you had the tabernacle, uh, that Moses told them how to make, and they made it, had the Ark of the Covenant. And then later Solomon built the temple, and that's where you had to go to do your um, sacrifices and oblations and get forgiveness from God. So this is talking about that you read throughout the whole testament where the Jewish people would, um, uh, how to say it, uh, they'd do right by the Lord and he'd bless them. And when they did wrong by the Lord, he gave them into their enemies' hands. And the biggest uh, time period was Babylon when they got sent to Babylon, but it's talking about that that God would hear them with their um, repenting and sacrifices in another place, in the enemy's territory, if you want to say it like that. But remember, 1 Kings 8, 47, if, Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land, whether they were carried captive, and repent, there's our word repent, and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive, in other words, they're you know, prisoners, slaves, not prisoners, but slaves, saying, we have sinned and have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. Now, like I said before, if verse, you go back to 46, if they, sin, if they sin against thee, see, when they sin against God, they were punished. And sometimes that punishment was God giving them into the hands of their enemies. Okay. Uh, Israel sinning against God, talking about Israel sinning against God and God delivering them to their enemies. Um, and then even though they're in their enemies' hands, that their repentance will be heard. 
but there's a few things there. Okay. Let's see. Definition number five in theology to sorrow or be pained for sin, a violation of God's holy law, a dishonor to his character and government, and the foulest ingratitude to a being of infinite be uh, benevolence. Now, so that's the con uh, context of repent in this passage. But I also like to point out that it said repent and make supplication. Once again, people try to say that repent means works. When you repent, it's works. Uh, no, it isn't. So far, we have yet to see repent where it means works. Repent is something that happens in your heart. And make supplication. So usually, so far, um, there's works before you repent, and there's works after you repent. But the actual repent part, there's no works. It's something that happens in your heart. So the whole point of this study is people attacking repent, biblical repentance when it has to do with salvation. Um, also that they confessed it with their lips. Remember it said, um, Captive and repent and make supplication, verse 47, unto thee the land of them that carried them captive, saying, we have sinned and have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. Um, confessing, okay? True repentance is followed by uh, confessing uh, with your lips. Kind of like salvation is. You repent, you believe, and you confess both in prayer. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Unto, before salvation. So context there. Sorrow or be pained for sin. Okay, if they truly repent, uh, they're asking God to hear them. Even though they're in the land of enemies, they're not in the promised land. All right. Now if you want to jump to the next book, that's the only time repent is mentioned in Kings. So 1 Chronicles 21.15, if you want to turn there, that's the next time the word repent is used. So far, I'm learning that repent, and I kind of, the whole point of the study was to go through and get the context to prove A, that when God repents, He's not a sinner. When we repent, we're sinners. And that repent itself isn't works. Okay? So far, we have yet to see repent being works. We have yet to see repent, meaning that when God repents, that He's a sinner. Okay? So 1 Chronicles 21.15. This is a rehashing, the retelling the story at 2 Samuel 24.16. And we went over that in the book of Samuel of the word repentance. So we're going to go over it quickly. King David, just give a summary. King David, instead of relying on God's strength, he decides to number the people of Israel to see how strong they are. When their strength is supposed to lie in, in God, God is supposed to be their strength and is their strength, just like He's our strength. Um, I can do all the things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So he numbers the people, and a prophet goes to him and says that he has sinned, and God's going to have three punishments you can choose from. And he chooses the one about the plague, and God sends an angel to destroy. And we're going to read this real quick. 1 Corinthians 21.15 and God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. That's the key here, to destroy it. God commanded Jerusalem to be destroyed. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. That right there should give us the definition. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Now, 2 Samuel 24, 16, this is a retelling of that story, but why that's so telling, the command was to destroy it. Then, then God said, you know what? That's enough. So what is that? He said destroy it. Now he's saying stop. That's enough. In other words, don't destroy it, Jerusalem. So that's definition number four. Apply to the supreme being a change uh, to change the course of providential dealing. Okay? It's a change in how God's going to deal with that situation. First, He's going to destroy Jerusalem. Then He says, you, you know what? I repent. I'm changing the providence. You're not going to destroy Jerusalem. Stop. It is enough. Okay? Once again, 
God is not a sinner because he repents. Repent does not always have to do with having sorrow for sinning against God. Uh, words have meaning. There's more than one definition to words a lot of times. So that's the only mention of repent and 1 Chronicles 21 15 has to do with God changing his providence, how he's dealing with that situation, with that sin, with that punishment. And brothers and sisters in Christ, rejoice and give thanks that God is that way. Because there's a lot of times, I almost a lot of times, too many to count where I deserve to be destroyed. I deserve to die a horrible death, especially when I was lost. But even today, I deserve to be punished hardcore for a lot of things I do, and God shows mercy on me. It starts out with punishment, and it doesn't become as bad as it should be, because God has mercy and grace towards me and towards you, brothers and sisters in Christ. But Job 42 is our next one, chapter 42. For me, Job's always a tough book. Um, but it takes the Holy Spirit, and God's been opening some things to me. And um, the whole book of Job, Job didn't do wrong, like he didn't sin. He wasn't being punished because he sinned. Um, there's two things. In your life, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you have bad things happen to you, one, it is because you've sinned. You've made choices, and now that the, you have to face the repercussions of those choices. You live by the flesh, you shall die. You go out and buy a $50,000 car, uh, now you have debt. And now you, you have sorrow because you have all this debt and a lot of your paychecks going towards that car. Um, but the other part is God humbling you. Okay. Um, third, I guess there's a third one, it's the lost world persecuting you for being a Christian. But there's times where God will do it to humble you. And then Job, God's doing it to prove to us as we read this that um, you can be righteous and still have bad things happen to you, but he's also proving Satan, you know, this whole book, like I said, it's, it's a tough book for me. But that's the whole context here. But when I did the study, and back in a Bible perversion, so I have to redo the study, but one thing I noticed, even in this, Job did do something wrong. He didn't sin, but he did do something wrong. He questioned God. God, why is this happening to me? Why are you allowing this to happen? Why are you doing this to me? So Job chapter 42. So Job is not, it's like almost like he's complaining. How many of us have complained before to the Lord? Uh, and not following the verse that's, um, which I'll read again, but I'll say it now too. Um, All things work together for good to them that trust God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Um, Job's two friends here, so I'll get to, I'm getting ahead a little bit. So the context where we're starting out is, is Job starts asking God why. Why are you doing this to me, Lord? Questioning God. Then God talks to him and says, who are you to question me? And that's when Job, this is when we're getting to the repentance part. Job repents of questioning God. Why have you done this to me? So Job 42, verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withheld from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Questioning God. Things to one, uh, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. For here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes seeth thee. Wherefore I pour myself, for what he did, I pour myself and repent in dust and ashes. Verse 7, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Ephraim, uh, Remember, Job, uh, God corrected Job. I just want to make sure that it was Job speaking. <laughs> Sometimes you get doubts. Verse 7, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the things that is right as my servant Job hath. Okay. Every time they tried to get Job to say he sinned against God and that God is punishing him, Job, at first, was trusting God. 
you know, uh, he was had such sorrow, all this stress, all these bad things were happen, happening to him. But I believe over time, the pressure got to him to where he did start questioning God towards the end. But why you question God? Um, in this world, we have a lot of people that pressure us, but that's not the main part of this teaching. It's the context. So when Job is repenting, there's two definitions this could fall under. Uh, definition number one, to feel pain, sorrow, or regret for something done or spoken. And this one, I put that one as the main one because he's repenting of what he said. Okay. You get up to uh, verse 3. It says, Therefore have I uttered that um, I understood not. Okay. He questioned God because he didn't understand why this was happening to him, what was going on. And God set him straight. But someone could argue for definition number two to express sorrow for something past because it's something he did in his past. But not super, super past. It was just recent. So I still stick with definition number one, something done or spoken. Sorrow. Notice I didn't put down sorrow for sin. It's just sorrow for something spoken. He, he fell into the, the, the asking God, why is this happening? And I've had brothers in Christ out there do the same thing. Um, and like I said, so far in my studies, three reasons why bad things will happen to you. Chastening of the Lord, you're living in sin, and there's consequences for your actions and your decisions in life. Now God, like I said, will show us great mercy, mercy we don't deserve, and grace. Um, sometimes God's humbling us. He's re reminding us to be humble, to always give thanks, okay, um, and give God the glory. And the third thing is, is persecution from this world. You're going to suffer for standing for God's word and, and su uh, suffering from the world. But here in context, to feel pain, sorrow, regret for something done or spoken. Uh, I believe Job had sorrow, regret for the words he said to the Lord. Why are you doing this? And he starts talking, you know, starts falling into the negativity. Why are you doing this, Lord? Uh, questioning God and that's a big thing today a lot of people question God but that's the context we got through three books <laughs> not many in these books just one each so so far we've seen that repentance when it comes to God is a change in providence repentance when it comes to man it has to do with sin having sorrow for sinning or having regret for doing something in the past that you don't want you shouldn't have done it's not necessarily a sin but you did something that you realized later didn't work out right, that you shouldn't have done it. Okay. So, uh, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next Repent Repentance Word Study. Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome back to another Repent slash Repentance Word Study. We're going to turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 90. Um, if you've been following along so far, we've been learning about the definitions of repent. And so far, repent has never meant when it's talking about God, that God's a sinner. And repent has never meant going from unbelief to belief. So, verse 90, we're going to read chap uh, verse one, chapter 90, verse 1 through 17. And the wind just caught it. As soon as I let go for a second, the wind can get it sometimes. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth wherever Thou hast formed the earth and the word, world, world. Even from everlasting to everlasting Thou art God. Thou turnest many to destruction and sayest, Return ye children of men. For, for a thousand years in Thy sight are but a, as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a, sh as a sleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourish and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. You know, when they get in trouble. This is talking about um, when they do good, God blesses them. When they do bad, God... Um, 
consumes him with his anger and his wrath. Verse 8, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. There's nothing hidden from the Lord. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years in a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, eighty, scores twenty years. Um, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so it is thy wrath. So teach us the number of our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. There's our word, repent. Remember that, repent concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, and we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servant, and thy glory unto thy, their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. So you go back up to 13. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. Providential dealings. It's talking about when God punishes the people for turning against them, they're asking for mercy. Okay? If you follow along in the books, uh, the repent studies and the other books, there's times where God said, okay, here's the punishment, and the punishment was supposed to be really great, sometimes to the brink of destroying Israel. And it'll start, and the punishment will go so far, and God will be like, that's enough. I repent, that's enough. So, change in dealings, and we've seen this a lot, but this is their prayer that God will repent. When punishment comes their way, they're praying that God will repent. So, definition. Apply to uh, definition number four. Apply to the supreme being to change the course of providential dealings. They're praying that the Lord will have mercy on them. Okay. They get punished that God will bring them back. Let's turn to Psalms 106:45. Psalms 106:45. One hundred six forty-five, but we're going to start in verse 40. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. What's that? Uh, the Jewish people. And he gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection unto their hand. Many times did, the, did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel, and were brought low for their iniquities. Punishment. Nevertheless, he regarded their afflictions when he heard their cry. And here's verse 45. And he remembered for them his covenant, and repented according to the multitudes of his mercy. There's times where God was going to destroy the Jewish people, but he stopped. He repented because of the covenant. Okay? Because of the promise he made to Abraham. The promises he made to I, uh, Jacob. Okay. So once again, providential dealings. This isn't God sinning at all. It's just God saying, I'm going to change my providential dealings. I'm going to punish you like this. And it's supposed to be very severe, but I have mercy. They start crying out to the Lord saying, Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. And the Lord repents, and he doesn't go as far as he planned in that punishment. Okay. So, uh, moving along, Psalms 110, Psalms 110, not too far ahead. We're going to read the whole chapter. We could always sing the whole chapter, <laughs> but um, Psalms 110, The Lord said unto my Lord, Set thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. 
Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the place, places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. And if you look at verse 4, that's where our word repent is. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. In other words, providential dealings. He's saying, I'm not going to change. Okay, here's the part he's not going to change. Thou art a priesthood forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's saying, I will not change that. That is going to be set forever. And there's a lot of people that ask me questions, and we looked into it a little bit, but Melchizedek, could this be another uh, reference to Jesus? Um, okay. Because it's pretty single. Uh, single, singular, if I can say it. But right now, for repent, the context of this is providential dealings. Jesus isn't going to change. Our Jesus, well, he is God. God is not going to change his mind on that. So, once again, God's not a sinner. He just changes his providential dealings. He's going to do it this way, and he's going to change. That one was saying he's doing it this way, and he's not going to change. Okay. Last place we're going to Psalms 135. So shoot over to Psalms 135. And we only have to read the actual verse, 135, 14. For the Lord will judge his people, and he will repent himself concerning his servants. Okay. Repent change in providence. He's going to be judging people. And he's going to be changing his mind sometimes, like uh, when it said he repented that Saul uh, would be king. It's he, he, he did, like I said, some people will say, well, he changed his mind. He changed his providence because what happened? He made, king, uh, he made David king. Saul was supposed to be king, live until he's old and dead and be king, but he, he sinned against God so God repented of making him king, and he replaced him with another king. So right here, when it says, I believe, For the Lord will judge his people, and he will repent himself concerning his servants. Okay, uh, All through the Bible, you'll see that he'll choose somebody to do something, and the sinful flesh of man, uh, they'll fall into sin and temptation. And God will repent himself of that person that he's using, and he'll find somebody else to use. Um, a good example would be, uh, well, uh, King Saul, and then you had King David replace him, but also um, Daniel, um, no, Samuel, I think it's Samuel, where the priest, the father, uh, gosh, I wish I could remember the names, but bottom line, you had the father's sons in the priesthood were doing wicked things, and the, so the father called him out, but he didn't do anything about it. So God's like, I'm going to grab uh, Saul, uh, Samuel, and Samuel's going to be my man from now on. So, um, I'm not saying the word repent was there, but it's one of those things where God will take somebody that's a servant and say, okay, I can't use you anymore. I'm going to use this person. There's times in our lives, and I'm trying not to go, go into a study, but where God's going to say, I can't use you right now. Maybe it's because you're not ready. Or maybe it's because you're falling into sin and temptation. I've been struggling with it this week. Uh, I struggle with it all the time, but big time this week. So, as we see there, his repent there is change in providence of choosing who's going to be his servants. Okay, how he judges Israel, like the punishment. When there's judgment, there's punishment. Okay, sometimes there's going to be judgment and there's going to be rewards, but you're still going to suffer losses, like when we go to the uh, white throne judgment. We're still going to be judged but our works are going to be judged, and we're going to suffer a lot of losses. So, that's our re uh, repent study for the book of Psalms. Um, 
just uh, remember, words have meaning. One of the big things about this ministry that God has blessed me with being a part of is words have meaning. Every one of these times, a change in providence. And every one of these times, not once is it saying that God himself is a sinner because he repents. Remember, there's some times where a word can be used, it has a fundamental definition, and it can be used different ways, and that fundamental fund. The foundation of the definition is the same, but it's how it's used is different. But a lot of times, a lot of words have multiple definitions. And don't fall for these uniform translations where it's all got to have the same definition. Repentance means you're a sinner and you're repenting of your sin every time. So when God repents, He's a sinner. That was the whole point of doing this study, was to prove that God's not a sinner, and that repentance, when it comes to us, has to do with having sorrow for sinning against God. And repentance can sometimes mean a change of mind, okay? I was going to do this, but I repented, and now I'm doing something else. So we changed our mind. Uh, change of mind. But when it comes to us and salvation, that's the whole point of doing this study. But thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next book for Repent slash Repentance Word Study. Welcome back, and uh, we're getting back to the word studies. So, word study, repent slash repentance, and we are in the book of Jeremiah. So, if you want to turn to Jeremiah 4, uh, I'm just going to start in verse 20 to get in context. So, Jeremiah verse, chapter 4, verse 20. If I can say it right. So, Destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled, and my curtains in a moment. How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish. They have not known me. Talking about the Jewish people. They are sottish children, and they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. Sounds like a lot of people today. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. See how far we're going all the way. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by His fierce anger. This is important. Uh, it's broken down by the presence of the Lord and His fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee for the noise of the horsemen and bowmen, horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up upon the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken, and not a man dwell therein. And when, they, and when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou closest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with paintings, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee, they will seek thy life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in travail, and the anguish as of her that bringeth forth the first child, her first child, the voice of the daughters of Zion that bewaileth her, that spreadeth her hand, saying, Woe is to me, for my soul is wearied because of murderers. Now verse 28 is where we see the word repent. And the reason I went so far, it's a, it's a prophecy of what's going to happen to the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm hoping I'm not getting that wrong. But with this context, remember, this is all about the context of the word repent. Sometimes we can get into it a little bit. Sometimes it's just about getting repent because doing a huge study would take a long time. So repent in context here is definition number four. Apply to a supreme being to change the course of providential dealings. Why? Because it talks about it right here in verse 28. 
For this shall the earth mourn and the heavens above be black because I have spoken it. God's saying this is what's going to happen. I have purposed it. There is a purpose for the time of Jacob's trouble. And will not repent. He's not going to change. This is set up. It's going to happen. I'm not changing the providential dealings. If you've been following along with these word studies, you'll realize there's times where God says, I'm going to do this. He does it part way and then says, I'm going to repent. In other words, he's showing mercy and he's going to stop the punishment. So there's times where God will change providence, how he's going to do something. He said he's going to do this. He stops. Uh, we haven't got to the book of Jonah, but the people repent. He's going to destroy the city, but the people repent. And this isn't, I might destroy the city. I'm going to destroy the city. But the people repent, and he's like, okay, I won't. I'm going to repent. I'm not going to destroy the city. So, um, Jeremiah 4, repent there is not a physical act as far as the act of a physical act. It's not a work, okay? The whole point of these studies is to see if repent or repentance is ever a work in itself. We've learned that something happens before repentance. Something can happen after repentance, true biblical salvation. But repentance itself is not works. It's something that happens in the heart. God looks and says, okay, I've planned this. It's already going to happen. Even though this is in the past, it's prophesying in the future. It's going to happen, and I will not repent. I will not change my mind and say, okay, I'm going to forgive you, and that's not going to happen. All right. Next mention is Jeremiah chapter 8. A couple chapters over. Jeremiah chapter 8, 1 through 9. We're going to go through 1 through 9, starting at verse 1. At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon, and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved, and whom they have served, and after whom... They have, and after whom they have walked, and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered, nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. And death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of the evil family, which remain in all the places whither I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Shall they fall and not rise? arise? Shall he turn away and not return? Why then is the people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit, they refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented, here it is, no man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes into the battle. Now there's where we have our word repent. And we're going to keep going to get the context. But repent here, in theology, to sorrow or be pained for sin as a violation of God's holy law. That's the important part here. Why do we know that that's what repent means here? Let's keep reading. Verse 7. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointing, appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallows observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. How do, how do ye say we are wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. It's a question. Lo, certainly in vain may he it, the pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them. Okay? They're not repenting, they're not keeping the law. Okay? They're falling uh, into strange gods. If you read the whole Old Testament, after the, um, Solomon, the kings, one king would serve would be true to the Lord, take down the high places, other kings wouldn't, they'd build them back up again, worship false gods, and they'd come back to the Lord. False gods come back to the Lord. They went into Babylon. God freed them from Babylon eventually. 
And we're going to get to a good verse here about all that repenting that God keeps doing throughout the whole Old Testament. So far from our reading, I'm realizing that it's mentioning that God, and when He repents, remember, God's not a sinner because He says He repents. It's a change in providence. It's grace. It's mercy. He goes from doing this to doing this. And oftentimes, it's mercy. Okay? Finding out that it really shows God's mercy a lot throughout the Old Testament. So, um, talking about the law, the Jewish people won't repent. And what's one of the big things that they're doing that's wrong? They're worshiping false gods. They're letting sodomy in. I mean, they're doing a lot of wicked things that the law says they're not supposed to do. Okay? Next verse, Jeremiah 15. Let's go over to Jeremiah 15. And of course, that verse, another thing to point out is it's talking about how in the New Testament says the laws uh, are a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And that just shows, that's a verse showing, talking about it, how there's no way they could keep the law. Right? Um, Jeremiah 15, verse 5. We're going to start in verse 5. For who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem? Or who shall bemoan thee? Or who shall go aside to ask how thou doest? Thou hast forsaken me, saith the Lord. They went to false gods. Thou art gone backward, therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repenting. See, this is the big verse right here. And I will fan them with a fan in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people since they return not from their ways. Their widows are increased to me above the sand of the seas. I have brought upon them against the mother of the young men a spoiler at noonday. Let's see if I went too far. Yeah, I just meant to stop at verse 7. But notice what it says here in verse 6. I am weary with repenting. If you fall along in this study, brothers and sisters in Christ, God's been doing a lot of repenting throughout the Old Testament. He's been showing a lot of grace and a lot of mercy. I mean, you go through and the wicked things that the Jewish people are doing, worshiping false gods, even to the point of sacrificing animals to Baal. I think it was Solomon that got uh, pulled away from the Lord with strange wives and started worshiping Baal, and he was sacrificing kids, babies, to this thing. I mean, it's just wickedness, sodomy getting brought in, uh, marrying outside their kindred, and in doing so, they brought false gods in. And they're just living in wicked sin, and God just pounds them hard. But He doesn't destroy them. He has mercy. And this verse, repentance, repenting, still applies to this verse definition number four. We're using the Webster's 1820 dictionary and we're backing it up. Sometimes in my studies I might come across the word that I, I believe has a little bit of an alteration in how it's used versus with the Webster's 1820 dictionary or there's a definition that's not in the Webster's 1820 dictionary. So that's not my final authority. My final authority is the King James Bible which is why we're going through it. But it's still applied to a supreme being to change the course of providential dealings. God's growing weary is what it's talking about here. Okay. I am weary with repenting. Jesus comes onto the scene. They reject Jesus Christ. We're in what they call the church age. Then the time of Jacob's trouble comes back, and God's really going to discipline the Jewish people. And then the millennial kingdom. Uh, his repenting like he does in the Old Testament, he's getting weary and it's slowing down to the point where he's not going to need to repent anymore. Okay. So, repent there. Repenting has to do with the providential dealings that God does. How he deals with people. He's doing, he starts out doing this, he changes midway, he can change beforehand. Okay, I was going to do this, but now I'm not, because you repented. God gave us free will. He loves us. Next, we are going to 18. Jeremiah 18, 7. 
Jeremiah 18, 7 through 11. So we have two times repent is used, verse 8 and 10. So there's going to be two times to look for. But Jeremiah 18, starting in verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Change of providence. Okay? He's going to do evil to them. He's going to punish them. They do good. Was it turn from their evil? I will repent. So it's a providential dealing. So that's the first time. Second time, let's keep going. Verse 9. And at what instance I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it? If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Um, I'm supposed to go one more time. One more verse. Now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you, and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. Both time repentance in here has to do with providential dealings, but we'll go into it a little bit. The Old Testament, there was a lot of promises and there's a lot of things with what we call Bible ifs. If you do this, I'll do this, is the Lord saying. If you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, I'm going to do that. And that's what this is talking about. If you, if you are being punished of the Lord in the Old Testament, and even today, you, uh, chastisement, you repent and you turn from that evil, God will change from chastising you to blessing you. And the same thing goes with, you can be blessed by the Lord and everything's going great, but you fall back into sin. God's going to change and repent of that blessing and go back into chastening. That's what's going on here. Both times, it's a reference to the Lord repenting and it's a change of providence, how He's going to deal with you. If you do good, He's going to deal good with you. If you do bad, He's going to deal bad with you. Not, you know, punish you. And if he's punishing you, the repentance part is, if he's punishing you and you start doing good again and you repent, he, he repents and goes from punishing you to doing good. Taking care of you, blessing you, and vice versa. That's all this is talking about. Okay? Once again, God is not a sinner when he repents. And repentance is not a work. God repents, that's something that happens in him. Then, the action happens. Jeremiah, because right here he's saying he'll do it before the action happens or not happens. Yes, they're in wicked sin, but he's saying you do good. So, Jeremiah 20, next mention of repent. Begin to think repentance is a New Testament word. I haven't come across that yet. But Jeremiah 20, we're going to read 1 through 18. It'll be a long read, looks like. Uh, now Fasher, the son of Emer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Fasher smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the high gates of Benjamin, which was by the house of of the Lord. And it came to pass on the morrow that Fasher brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks, then said Jeremiah unto him, The Lord hath not called thy name uh, Fasher, I'm just going to use the word Pasher or Fasher, but gosh, I'm bad with names. Mag Mithibib. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends. And they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eyes shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. So we got an evil king, or pasher. Um, oh, he's the priest. I'm sorry, we just read that. And Isaiah, or Isaiah, Jeremiah, I got focus. 
Jeremiah is prophesying evil against him because of who he is and how he's acting. Moreover, I will deliver all the strength of this city and all the laborers thereof and all the precious things thereof and all the treasures of the kings of Judah will I give into the hand of their enemies which shall spoil them and take them and carry them to Babylon. And thou, Fasher, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity and thou shalt come to Babylon. And there thou shalt die, and shalt be buried there, thou and all thy friends to whom thou hast prophesied lies. Mary's priest. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in de derision daily, every one mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name, but his, but his word was in my heart, as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. If I heard the defaming of many Fear on every side, report say they, and we will report it. And all my familiars watched for my halting, saying, Peradventure will he be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. The Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one in that verse. That's just something that really got to sink in. A lot of people like to just preach, God is love, God is love. Uh, what does it say here? But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one to the enemies. Twelve. But, O Lord of hosts, and the whole point of going through this is letting you know the prophecy that's being prophesied by Jeremiah to Fasher. Pasher, Fasher. But, O Lord of hosts, that triest the righteous and seest the reins in the hearts, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I opened my cause. That's how they treated Jeremiah for prophesying truth. 13. Sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord. For he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. Cursed be the day wherein I was born. Let not the day wherein my mother bare me be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father, saying, Man child is born unto thee, making him very glad. And let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew, and repented not. And let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noontide. There's where we get our repentance. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 17. Because he slew me not from the womb, or that my mother might have been my grave, and her womb is to be always great with me. Wherefore came I forth out of the womb to see labor and sorrow, that my days should be consumed with shame? Question mark. Uh, Jeremiah is going through a lot. Okay, he's preaching truth. He's he's God saying say this. He's saying it, and it's having consequences. Kind of like preaching the gospel today and standing for absolute truth today. But we're doing context of repentance. He says it shows that he's prophesying something evil on somebody who's evil. Okay, and he's getting put in stocks. He's getting treated bad because of it. But here in verse 16, And let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew and repented not. Okay. This goes to number four again, providential dealings. Applied to a supreme being, change of course. He's saying those cities that God didn't repent, he destroyed them. He didn't change his mind saying, okay, I'll spare the city. Um, chances are they didn't repent. I'm almost positive about that. But he's saying those cities like Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't repent of what he did. He destroyed the city top to bottom. Um, there's a lot of things that God has done that he didn't repent. He didn't change his providence. They didn't repent themselves. They didn't want God's mercy, so he didn't show it. It's that simple. 
So the context here is he's preaching evil against Fasher. He's getting punished for it, having a, you know stocks and then being dragged before him, and he's being weary. It's almost like he's he's sorrowful and he's talking that way. So providential dealings, God changing. He's, the point here is saying that I hope he doesn't change. He doesn't repent of the evil he's going to do. And he's talking about himself, you know, being weary of life and death. I think it was Paul that said that. Um, I could be wrong. Next, verse 26. There's a lot of mentions to repentance in this book, a lot of prophecy. Verse 26, we're going to start at verse 3, and there's two more mentions in these. If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. Once again, they're doing bad. He's going to punish them. They start going, they repent of the bad they're doing. He's, God's going to repent of the bad he's doing, the evil. Uh, the punishment. It's a good way to say it. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, if we... If ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. Then will I make this house like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him saying, Thou shalt surely die. Uh, sparing life and death. I can understand. I can't truly fathom what he's going through, Jeremiah, but he's doing what the Lord told him to do without the, who cares about the consequences. It bothers him. It wears on him. Uh, he gets depressions, which it sounds like the last verse we were talking about. Thou shalt surely die. Verse 9. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord, and sat down in the entry of the new gate, of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city, as ye have heard with your ears. Then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and to all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings, and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath purposed, or hath pronounced against you. Both times talking about a providential dealing, uh, apply to a supreme being to change the providence. It's God saying, if you do this, I'm going to do that. It's guaranteed. But if you do this, I won't do that. He's already saying, I'm going to do this. He's going down a path. Okay, you do evil, I'm going to punish you. It's guaranteed to happen. You start doing evil, God's going to go punish you, but you repent and you turn from the evil. God's like, okay, I won't do the evil. You repented my grace, my mercy. Providential dealing. There's a lot of that in the Bible. God's grace and God's mercy is shown throughout all the Bible. When God repents, it's not Him being a sinner. Okay, repentance is not a work, and it doesn't mean, repent itself does not mean that when God does it, that He's a sinner. Words have meaning. Words do not have just one definition every time. And it has to be the same. Uniform, uniform translation, no. Unif I'd say uniform definition. We'll say it like that. It doesn't have a uniform definition across the board. Jeremiah 31. Got a couple more and we're finished. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 
Jeremiah 31, verse 18 through 20. We're going to start in 18. I have surely heard Ephraim's bemoaning himself thus, Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke, turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. After he turned. Okay? This is what they try to claim repentance is for salvation. You've got to change your life, and then you repent. Uh, that repentance is works, but some people say that means you have to clean up your life, and then you get saved. No. We've learned in this study that there's people who clean up everything first, and then repent. Then there's people who repent, and then clean everything up. Repentance is something that happens in the heart. Um, 19. Repentance here. I have put two definitions you could argue. To feel pain, sorrow, or regret for something done or spoken. Because he already changed and turned. He was chastised of the Lord. He turned from that wickedness. And now he's repenting. He's having sorrow for something he did. For uh, Definition number two, to express sorrow for something past. Okay. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed. I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed. Okay, that's why I said regret for something done or spoken. Because I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. Okay. Repentance. To feel pain, sorrow, or regret for something done or spoken. Repent in this context. Okay. God chastened him. The change happened before. Then he repented. And we've noticed, uh, I know I'm repeating myself sometimes, that it's for me and it's for you. We know that actions can happen before repentance, and we know that actions can happen after repentance, but that repentance itself happens here. Okay. Last time Jeremiah, chapter 42. Last time repent is mentioned. Chapter 42. Okay. Starting at verse 5. Going to go from 5 through to 12. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all the things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. I believe the evil part it's talking about is, and I'm not trying to go in depth, um, you're going to do things for the Lord. This is a little side note. You're going to do things for the Lord, and sometimes bad things are going to happen to you because you're doing what the Lord wants you to. You're going to live according to the Lord, word of the Lord. You're going to do right knowing that bad things are going to happen to you. Right? You're going to get fired. Okay, someone comes to you and says, and you, the Holy Spirit in you says this person is sincere. They want to know about Jesus, you tell them about Jesus, a third person overhears, and you get fired for it. You know if you preach Jesus at work, there's a chance you can get fired. A uh, family coming out and saying, I'm a King James Bible believer, Bible believing, God fearing man or woman, repercussions with family, how the lost world's going to treat you, you know, all kinds of things. So, good or evil, they're going to obey the voice of the Lord our God. And it came to pass after ten days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah. Then called he Jonah, Jonan, the son of Curia, I hope I that, and all the captains of the forces which were with him, and all the people from the least even to the greatest, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom ye send me to present your supplication before him. If ye will still abide in this land, then will I build you and not put, pull you down, and I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I repent me of the evil that I have done unto you. We're going to go to 12. Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you 
from his hands. So they're already in his hands because God punished him. Now he's repenting of the evil, the punishment, and he's going to get him out. Verse 12, And I will show mercies unto you, that he may have mercy upon you, and cause you to return to your own land. Once again, a lot of times when we see repent, when it comes to the Lord, we see it all through the book of Jeremiah, it has to do with mercy. God showing mercy. He could have gone all the way and continued punishing somebody. He got mad at Israel once he was going to utterly destroy them. But they repented, and God repented. Now I understand that God wasn't going to destroy them utterly. He made a promise to Abraham. Um, but the point is, is, it's all about mercy when God repents. Him showing mercy. Um, he stops the evil. It's also about um, His love for you, because chastisement is a good thing. Uh, you're to fear it before it happens. It's supposed to be a good motivator. It's the best motivator should be to do what's right. And when you fall into sin and you can't, you just won't repent. God will chastise you, and afterwards it's a good thing. It shows love. So His repentance shows love, and it shows mercy. But once again, when God repents, it's Him showing love and mercy. It's not saying He's a sinner. It's not saying, the Bible's not saying that God's a sinner because He repents. When we repent, it's because we're sinners, or we did something that causes us to regret the, what we did. Okay, a good example of that would be I decide I'm going to put huge tires on my truck without doing the lift and I start driving it and it starts grinding and hurting the truck so then I'm like, man I repent, I put those tires on and I put other tires on. Was it a sin? No. But the outcome was bad and I had sorrow for what I did. You hurt your truck. So that's the book of Jeremiah. We're moving along. Um, repentance, not a work. Don't let people tell you otherwise that repentance is a work and you're trying to teach works-based salvation when true biblical repentance is part of salvation. It's an important part of salvation. It right? happens in here. Repentance happens in here. So when you have your belief, it makes it down to here. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if you skip repentance, that belief is just up here. It doesn't make it down here without repentance. That belief will never leave your head and make it to your heart if you skip repentance. God had mercy. God looks at the heart. So that's the word study repent for Jeremiah. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you brothers and sisters in Christ and I will be praying for you. Continue to pray for me in this ministry that God has blessed me with being a part of. I'll see you in the next video. Hello brothers and sisters and welcome back to another word study on repent slash repentance. We are in the book of Ezekiel. Um, as you can see I, I left the window open a little bit. It's raining today. So those of you who watched the last study or those who have been praying for us, I mentioned the last study that our well was kind of going dry. Um, it had been a while since it actually rained up here. But God blessed us with rain and we've got rain today. Praise the Lord. But if you want to turn to Ezekiel 14, chapter 14, verse 1, we're going to get in context and we're going to show the word repent and show you guys together we're going to learn what it means in context. So, verse 14, starting in 1, and we're going to go all the way to 11. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Remember I read in uh, Psalms that King David wrote, um, uh, If I hide iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. And I'm paraphrasing. I'll put it down at the bottom. Um, iniquity, and it talks about up there how they're having idols in their heart. See, their idols are in their heart. See, their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of, of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. 
capital L Lord, capital G God. There's another instance where it's saying Jesus Christ who is God. There's only one capital G God, the Father, and only one capital L Lord, Jesus Christ. Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him and cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols. So I'm talking about uh, Israel sinning, worshiping idols in their heart. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent. I find it important, that's so important when it comes to having false gods and idols. Repent is capitalized. Capital R. And turn yourselves and. Okay, it's saying repent and turn yourselves. Two things. Repent happens here, we're going to find out in context, and then the change life. Turn away. And turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourn in Israel, which separateth himself from me, and setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. Now we can see the context of repent. Okay? In theology, the sorrow or to be pained for sin as a violation of God's holy law. What was one of the laws? I have no gods before me. Okay? Uh, verse 8. And I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. We're not going into that study, but let that sink in. And I will stretch out my hand upon him, and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. In other words, prophet that lies, he's going to suffer the same punishment as the person who did the sin. Okay. That the house of Israel may be no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, saith the Lord God. Okay? I went that far to explain the punishment. So we see that repent, what's going on here is the Jewish people are getting back into idols. And I like the key points where it's talking about how they have idols in their heart. Okay? Capital R is repent and repentance and repent. And then it says, and turn yourself from your idols two things. People are always saying that repent or repentance is a work. It's a work. But we've yet to see it being a work. Repent or repentance happens in the heart. Just like they have these false idols in the heart, they need to repent in the heart. And when they've repented, then they turn from their idols. Mm -hmm. Context. Ezekiel 14 uh, verse 6, that's our word repent, context, having sorrow for sinning against God, a violation of God's holy law, as a violation of God's holy law. And it happens in the heart. Next, we're turning to Ezekiel 18.28. Ezekiel 18, verse 28. And we're going all the way through to 32. Okay, because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Turning from your sin. This is cleaning up his transgressions. In 29, yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? It's a question mark. 
Are not your ways equal? That's also a question. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Once again we see Lord and God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 6. There is only one God, capital G, the Father, and one Lord, capital L, Jesus Christ. The Godhead, and I know it's off subject a little bit, but the Godhead is revealed to us in the New Testament so we, brothers and sisters, can look back in the Old Testament and go, that's talking about Jesus Christ, who is God. The Father, Jesus who is God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Notice it says again, repent and turn. Two separate acts. 31, I think we're going to 32. 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? There it is again. A new heart. Repent and repentance happens in the heart. Then the change. 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Okay. Starts here. Then it's another, then it becomes, the next step is a physical act. Let's turn to Ezekiel 24, 14. The last time it's mentioned in Ezekiel. 24, 14. So that one also is a definition of repent. It has to do with sorrow in your heart for sinning against God, a violation of God's law. For us today, it's a violation of His Word, law too, but it's also His Word. Okay, there's a lot of commands in the New Testament, which is called instruction in righteousness. Okay. 24. Verse 14. 24 verse 14 and we're only going to read 14 because it's pretty evident 14 I the Lord have spoken it it shall come to pass and I will do it they've done something wrong God is saying I'm going to do this okay I will not go back neither will I spare will I spare neither will I repent According to thy ways and according to thy doings shall the judge shall they judge thee, saith the Lord God. Okay. Once again, Israel is in sin. They will not change. They won't repent. So God's saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. And we've seen this all through the Bible in the Old Testament as we've been going through. So what is repentance here? Okay. Apply to a supreme being to change the course of providential dealings. That's the biggest thing. God changing how he deals with people is repent when he repents. It's just how he's changing. He's going to do this, and he knew he's going to change, but he's letting us know he was going to do this. He's honest, but he's going to repent. Okay, you did this. I'm going to do this. You do. Remember the one verse, if you can remember, I can't remember what it says. If you do good, I'll do good by you. You do bad, I'm going to do bad to you. God's saying that they wouldn't repent, so he's making a prophecy, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and he's saying, I will not repent. I will not change from what I said I was going to do. Mm -hmm. So, three times in the book of Ezekiel, it's so important to remember what we saw in the first two passages of repent, that repent and turn, two separate acts. Turning from sin follows repentance. Repentance itself is not the change. Like you, repent means you clean up your life. No, it doesn't. Repentance, and as we saw in the first two, is something that happens in the heart. Okay. So this is repent slash repentance in Ezekiel. I'll see you in the next video. Okay, welcome back to another word study, repent slash repentance. We're going to be in the books of Hosea, Joel, and Amos. So we're going to start in Hosea chapter 11, verse, eight, uh, verse 7.
And my people are bent to backsliding from me, though they called them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Ad Adma? How shall I set thee as Zeboam? My heart is turned within me, my repentings are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of mine anger, I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God, and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. They shall walk after the Lord, he shall roar like a lion, get a hold of that one, when he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. Remember Jesus came as a lowly, lowly and meek, a lamb. He's coming back as a lion. But going back to verse 8, where it says, My repenting are kindled together. Kindled, I went ahead and looked that up. Set on fire and flame, but here's the thing, excited into action. My repentings, plural, are kindled together. God throughout the whole Old Testament, as we've learned, most of the words repent that we've come across have to do with God punishing Israel and changing how he's punishing Israel. He starts it and then he stops it. He, plant, he said he's going to destroy Israel. He's going to go through this punishment. Israel repents and God repents, changes how he's going to deal with them. So all those repentings that he's done is kindled and it's talking about this is prophecy, but it's talking about his dealings, how he's going to deal with Israel. As we read up there, what is it? And my people are bent to backsliding from me. They just keep backsliding. You keep reading about it, backsliding, backsliding. So Jesus came, God manifests in the flesh, to be their king. And they denied him as king. Uh, they crucified him. Uh, Jesus will be coming back at the end of times of Jacob's trouble to set up the millennial kingdom. And he's sealing 144,000 Jews in the forehead. And he's going back to dealing with Israel to fulfill prophecy. Okay. So we see there the context. And that's the whole point of these studies. Context. We're here to prove that repent or repentance, the actual action is not an action like works. It's something that happens in the heart. It's not works to have repentance as part of salvation. We get told, brothers and sisters, that lie so much, and the lost world gets told that lie so much by a lot of professing Christians and false religions. Okay. Uh, verse 9, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger, I will not return to destroy Ephraim. That is right there is what the repenting is that God's doing. Hosea 13, 14. We're going to go to Hosea 13, verse 14, and we're going to read... Uh, 9 through 16. So let's go to verse 9 and Hosea 13. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Absolutely. I will be thy king, whereas any other that may save thee in all cities. Where is any other that may save thee in all cities? Question. And thy judges of whom thou sayest, give me a king and prince. Here's the key, not for what we're doing, but a key for what I'm about to mention. I gave thee a king in mine anger and took him away in my wrath. Uh, Saul, remember the story of Saul. Uh, the people wanted a king. God's like, I am your king. But they rejected God as being their king. What happened when Jesus came here? Uh, they rejected their king. When Saul was, when you read the story about Saul, they wanted man to be king. Mankind, they wanted a man, flesh and blood, to be king. So then, when Jesus come, God gives him a man. Jesus came in the flesh. He had to eat, he had to drink, he had to sleep. Okay. He was, like I said, he came as a lamb. What did they do? They rejected him as king and said, we have no king but Caesar. So I thought that was very important. This is prophesying. Twelve. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is hid. 
The sorrow of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long. I don't know if you can hear that, but that's my dog barking. Should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grace, I will be thy grave. I'm sorry. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. We're going to go over this because this is a great example or a great teaching on what Jesus did. Verse 15. Thou shalt. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up, he shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword, their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with children shall be ripped up. Very, very straightforward. No sugar, sugar coating, no uh, trying to take it down a notch, like trying to sh make it seem pleasant or nice. But we read there, Hosea 13, 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. Rescue, deliver is what ransom means. Uh, remember this, because we're going to get to a very important verse in the New Testament. I will redeem them from death. I looked up the word redeem. To rescue, to recover, to deliver from. O death, I will be thy plagues, O grave. Okay. I will be thy destruction. Plague, to vex, destruction, eternal death, ruin. Jesus overcame death. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. The whole thing about here when it talks about uh, the next last part of uh, Hosea 13, 14. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. When God saves a sinner, or He saved Israel, He doesn't regret it. Okay? There's some things as we read that when God says this is going to happen, it's going to happen. So two parts I looked at this and said, you know what? God does not regret a decision He makes. When He repents, changes how He's dealing with things, He doesn't regret it. When He saves you, when Jesus Christ saves you, he doesn't regret it. Oh man, you know what? I shouldn't have saved him. Look at him. He's fallen into sin. I shouldn't have saved him. God won't do that. God says, hey, this is going to happen in the future. This is what I'm doing to you now. He will not repent. Mainly what he's talking about in the future. These are future, future prophecies and he's not going to repent. Repentance is going to be what does it say right there? Uh, Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Okay. Remember how God deals with us. This is the first time we see repentance, and it has to do with change of mind. Okay, Sorrow for anything done. God's not sorry for saving somebody. Okay. And He's not going to change His mind when it comes to these prophecies. They will be fulfilled. Some have already been fulfilled. Some have yet to be fulfilled. So that's the book of Hosea. Let's go to the book of Joel. Next book. Two times repent is used in this book. I also found it interesting in Hosea, we found the first time that repentance with the A-N-C-E is used in the whole Old Testament. I ferment there, like I said, we learn things. I was thinking there for a while, I thought maybe repentance was just a New Testament word. Whereas repent, repenteth, repented, repenting, that's all Old Testament as far as we don't see repentance, the actual word repentance. But we did. Joel 2, 12. 
Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye ever, even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Okay? Talking about repentance of him evils, talking about how God deals with people. He changes his providence. Okay, I'm punishing him. I'm not going to punish him as much as I want as I said I would. I was going to punish him, and they repented, so I didn't punish him at all. Okay? It's showing how he is merciful, gracious, for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of evil. He's talking about them that they need to turn, turn ye even to me with all your heart. Uh, repentance happens in the heart. Notice it says over here, 13, and rend your heart and not your garments. It's not an outward showing. It's supposed to be inside the heart. That's what repentance is when it applies to us. Okay, this is talking about how God deals with things. But I found it interesting when you saw, for he is gracious and merciful. And God put it in my heart for me to go over uh, 2 Samuel 12, 21. Because a lot of times you come across people in the New Testament when we preach the true gospel of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, they always grab spots where they say there is no repenting here. There is no repenting there. They, what they mean is, is the word repentance is not there. The act of repenting in the heart, repentance, the state of the person is there, but they'll ignore that. So let's go back to 2 Samuel 12, 21. God put this on my heart, and I read it, and I was like, this is King David saying whether God would repent or not, yet he's not using the word repent. Okay, to get in context, because I didn't want to go through it all and probably should read it all. Okay, King David murdered a man and committed adultery. And the, the uh, actions, the consequences of committing that adultery is Bathsheba got pregnant. Okay. So uh, God sends a prophet to tell King David all his punishments and basically bring to light his sin that he thought he did in darkness. But God brought it to light. He did it privately, is what I mean by darkness. He did it privately, thinking nobody knew. Okay. God knows. There's a lot of people today that do the same thing. God knows. It doesn't matter if nobody else sees you. If you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, God sees you. And eventually, he's going to bring it to light. But we're here where the child's dead. King David's on the ground, sackcloth, ashes. He's fasting. And he overhears the servant say his child is dead. So this is what he does after that. He gets up, I'm sorry, he gets up, he eats, he cleans himself off after the child's dead. 2 Samuel 12, 21. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, this is King David, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Notice what he just said there. See, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that he that the child may live. God told him the child's going to die. Bugs. God told him the child's going to die. But what is King David saying? He's basically saying, who knows whether God will repent of that punishment that I'm supposed to bear. Who knows if God will repent? So the word repent doesn't always have to be used, specifically that word. Okay, the action of repentance can be there. Uh, the hope of repentance can be there. Amos 7. So that is the book of Joel. Um, when you look in there, hopefully I didn't 
think I might have skipped one on accident. 14. Who knoweth if he will return and repent? That's talking about us. Who knoweth he will return and repent? Not us as far as um, me in church age. I'm talking about it's man. It's talking about man. Uh, repenting, having sorrow in their heart for sinning against God. Okay? So the two times it was used. One, the first time as God, how God deals with people. Whether he changes how he's going to deal with somebody. Punishment. Prophecy. Uh, who knoweth if he will return and repent, talking about man, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Now, Amos, book of Amos, the last book we're going to do. The Amos chapter 7, verse 1. Sorry, got to do that. Amos chapter 7, verse 1. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowing. And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O Lord God, forgive me, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. Arise. Remember the promise. Okay? Israel will be as the sands of the sea. Will be more numerable than the numberable, like the numbers would be more than the stars in heaven. Okay, that hasn't happened. That's why he's saying, "Whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small." The Lord repented for this. It shall not be, saith the Lord. God will keep His promise. The millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, the Jewish people, Israel, will become like that the, the numbers will be outstanding out out outrageous if you want to say it that way the promise is going to be fulfilled Jesus will be ruling and reigning in peace for a thousand years okay how God God's saying that's not going to happen he's going to keep his promise he's not changing that providence what he's going to do verse 4 thus hath the Lord God showed unto me and behold the Lord God called to contend by fire, and it devoured the great deep, and did eat up a part. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee, by whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. Once again, God's dealing out judgment. But remember, Jacob, the promise, we are small. The Lord repented for this, this also shall not be, saith the Lord God. He's not going to wipe out the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble. He never wiped out the Jewish people throughout the Old Testament. When they rejected Jesus Christ and they crucified him on the cross, God didn't wipe out Israel. Okay? He's not going to repent of his promise. He's not done with Israel. I looked up contend when it said contend by fire, to strive in opposition to punish. So he's punishing with fire. But as we see in both of these spots, it has to do with God saying, this shall not be. He's not going to repent of his promise that he made. Israel, Jacob is another word for Israel. Thou, thy name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, as we read in the Old Testament. So, as we see once again that repent, repentance has nothing to do with works. It's something that happens in the heart. When God repents, it's not a sin. he's not being a sinner. In his heart, he's saying, it is enough. They repented, so I'll repent and I won't punish them. I've made prophecies of the future that I'm not going to change. That's what it means when God repents. He's not going to change anything. Or he will change something. So, sorry about that. So, as we see, people are going to keep attacking you and saying brothers and sisters in Christ, who stand for the true gospel, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confessing both in prayer and calling upon the name of the Lord to save you. People are going to attack you and attack you and say repentance is works. We've gone through most of the Old Testament. We have Jonah and another book that has the word repent or repentance in it. And so far we've yet to see repent, repentance being a physical act. It's something that happens in the heart. So grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Thank you for sticking with me for this far. I just wanted to go through every book hardcore so there's no question that repent or repentance is not a physical act. It's something that happens in the heart. The physical act can, is evidence of repentance. The actual repentance happens in the heart. The changed life comes after salvation and it's evidence that you repented. And then your belief because you repented happened in the heart. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 talks about how you can believe in vain. You skip repentance and you just believe it's in the head. Your belief is in vain and you're going to hell. Okay? You don't want to believe in vain. You cannot skip repentance. You can't. And the changed life isn't works-based salvation. In other words, the changed life isn't you earning salvation. The changed life is evidence that you repented. And as we've gone through plenty of books, we showed that people would repent and then clean up their life. Sometimes people would clean up everything and then repent. Okay? Today, you need to repent first. You always need to hit your knees and repent. Then turn. Okay? One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is Jesus Christ. He's talking. He says, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me. Repent, forsake, and move on. Whatever that was that caused you to drop your cross, because it says daily, when you pick up your cross, you're forsaking what caused you to drop your cross. You're turning from it. You want a 180, and that's after repent, denying yourself, your self-righteousness, your pride. Yes, Lord, I screwed up. Please forgive me. True sorrow for God. Okay. One of my favorite verses in the Bible because it talks about our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. It's a great verse explaining our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. You're going to fall into sin and temptation, but you need to repent. And repent happens in the heart. Evidence of repenting is picking up your cross. Saying I'm sorry, but leaving your cross on the ground is not repent. You didn't really repent. Okay, there's two types of repentance. Worldly sorrow, godly sorrow. Okay, two types of things that, that you'll repent. You repent because you got caught and all the punishment and all the pain you're going through, or you're going to repent of what you did and say, I deserve what, what God's doing to me. I deserve this suffering. I deserve to go to hell. So I kind of went on a little bit more than I wanted to. So thank you for watching. I'll see you in the book of Jonah. That's the next book. And uh, please stand, stand, stand for repentance as part of salvation because it is part of salvation. See you in the next video. Okay, brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome back to our word study, Repent slash Repentance. And remember, our main focus is to realize, is repentance or repent ever a physical act, or is it something that happens in the heart? The evidence of repentance is a physical act that comes after repentance. And as we've seen, we're going to finish up the Old Testament with Repent slash Repentance. And when we get into the New Testament, it's going to be amazing. Because we're going to be focusing hardcore on salvation and repentance as it applies to salvation. Okay? Now, uh, we're in the book of Jonah and Zechariah. The last two books with the word repent slash repentance. Okay? I didn't think it was, but in the last study or the study before in one of the books, there was the word repentance. So repentance was used once in the Old Testament. But most of the time it's repent, repented, repenteth. Um, so... Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, if you want to turn there in your King James Bibles. Jonah's chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to go all the way to 10. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, because remember the first time he ran, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. Okay? In other words, it took three days to walk across the city of Nineveh. And, Jago and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So... He's prophesying because the city's so wicked 
that God's going to destroy the city in 40 days. So the people of Nineveh believed God, they believed God, and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. So they put on sackcloth, he put on ash on his head, and they're fasting. Verse 8, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. You know, call upon the name of the Lord to save you. I'm just throwing that in there because they're crying unto God. Uh, don't do this, please. Please, you know, spare us. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil ways and from the violation, violence that is in their hands. Okay? Verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? Right. Two things again. We always see that. Repent and turn. Turn and repent. Right. Turn is the action. Repent is what happens in the heart. But in this situation, it's talking about God. So let's go. I'm going to start over at 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Remember, one of the definitions of repent that we've seen in the Old Testament is how God deals with people. It's not saying that God is a sinner. It's saying that God's going to change how he deals with people. One of the great verses we went over together, brothers and sisters in Christ, was talking about that if they're doing good, if they go from bad to doing good, God will repent of the evil that he puts upon them, the punishment, and he'll bless them. But if they turn from the good to the bad, he will repent of the blessing them and punish them. So it's all about, it's the best verse to show how God changes his providence, how he's dealing with a person, people, okay, how he's going to do things. Verse 10, and God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not, okay? God saw their works, evidence of them repenting. They repented in their heart. They believed God. They were wicked people. God's going to destroy the city in 40 days. They, they repented. Then the evidence of that repenting was their works after they repented. Okay? But this word repent is talking about the Lord changing what he's doing. He's going to destroy the city and now he's not going to destroy the city. He repented of destroying the city. Doesn't mean that God's a sinner. Okay. Some people always throw that in there saying, what are you saying, God's a sinner because he repented? Uh, it's all about context, brothers and sisters in Christ. Context, context, I'll say it again, context. Let's turn to Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, or some could be on the same page. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, we're going to go all the way through 4. 4. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, if I can say it properly. Okay. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Okay? It displeased him exceedingly. Okay, here's where you guys see how Jonah gets selfish. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God. And merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and representest thee of the evil. Repentest, I'm sorry. Repentest thee of the, of the evil. There's our word, repentest. Verse 3, we're going all the way to 4. Verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. It's getting pretty dramatic. Then said the Lord, Dost thou well to be angry? And you read about this. Um, he went, he preached, the people deserved to die, 
and the city deserved to be destroyed for the sin that was going on, and he felt God should have destroyed the people. Now, I know some people disagree with me, but part of me also feels that it's a pride thing, too, he's, that, you know, he said it was going to happen, now it's not happening. It's a pride thing. But he did talk about how God's grace, great, grace, uh, if I can say my words this morning, Gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and great kindness and repentance thee of the evil. He knows that God will repent of evil sometimes. I'm not saying he doesn't. But if you look at what he went through when he tried to run, and he's like, went in there, finally went in there, did what he was told, obeyed the Lord, he's getting very uh, selfish. Those, and like he was the judge. Like he, he should have been the judge and said they deserve to die. But that's not the focus where we're looking on. Repentance. This is talking about what the people were hoping for. And God did. It's talking about providence. God dealing with the people. He knew that God would repent when people re repent. Uh, that there's times where God will change what he's going to do. If he's going to do evil, he'll change and do good. Or he'll stop the evil. Or the evil won't, as we've looked in our studies, the evil won't be as bad. He means it to be really hardcore punishment destruction and he'll stop halfway and repent because the people start repenting okay so once again in context here it's talking about God changing how he's going to deal with something Jonah's saying I know that you don't you repent sometimes you have such grace and mercy so that's all for the book of Jonah we will be turning to Let's see, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1. Remember, this is just a context study. This isn't like a big in-depth study. Sometimes we might learn something pretty neat, and we will go in-depth a little bit, but for the most part, it's a context to find out what the context of the word repent or repentance is and get the definition. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 1, we're going to go all the way through to 15. And it's going to be a while until we get to the Word, but we're trying to get everything in context of what's going on here. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. You know, we read through the whole Old Testament how they're having to repent because they go after strange gods. And God said, I am a jealous God. You'll have no gods before me. Verse 3, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for every age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Pretty nice. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine eyes? Saith the Lord of hosts, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their gods in truth and in righteousness. Now, like I said, this isn't an in-depth study, but part of me sees that, and it just reminds me of how the prophecy about Jerusalem becoming a nation again, and the people were... were went back to Jerusalem, okay, he brought them from the um, east country and the west country, and he saved them in the sense that they weren't wiped out. But I'm not saying that's exactly what this is talking about, but that's just what I remember and think about when I read that passage. Verse 9, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, yea, that here in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. And brother and sister in Christ, they're rebuilding the temple right now in Jerusalem. It's already been approved and everything. Um, I don't know if they've hit the groundwork yet, but it's being rebuilt. Verse 10. 
For before these days there was no hire for man, nor any hire for beast, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, every one, against his neighbor. Remember when Jesus, and I always like applying this, when Jesus said he didn't come to bring peace but a sword, okay. uh, set a man at variance, uh, father against son, or son against father, or, I, I gotta look that up, father against son, uh, mother against daughter, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. Okay, set neighbor against neighbor. But now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, he's changing. Things are changing. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, and the ground shall give her increase, and the heavens shall give their due, and I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. And it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathens, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I, as I thought to punish you, when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. There's our word repented. Uh, fathers, we've gone through the Old Testament together, and seeing how the Jewish people... Israel, throughout the Old Testament, they'd serve God, then the next generation they'd fall away from God. They'd serve God, they'd fall away from God. Okay, their fathers provoked them to wrath by bringing in false gods, uh, sexual perversions, um, disobeying God. Okay? God said, don't do this, and they did it. Verse 15, we're going all the way to 15. So again have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, fear ye not. Okay? In the Old Testament there were times where God repented not. Okay? There were times where he was almost like he was going to destroy Israel, but he repented. He changed. He didn't destroy them utterly. He didn't scatter them to the four winds. Uh, and some of the stories of the Old Testament when it looked like he might have. So, right here as we see, I repented not, as God talking, he didn't change his providence, how he was dealing with the fathers that provoked him to wrath in the Old Testament, okay, before this was written. So as we can see with this word study, praise the Lord, we are done with the Old Testament, in the sense that the New Testament, I'm just really excited about doing the New Testament more than anything, but I wanted to do a thorough word study, so it's not just me saying, you know, repentance is never a work. Just take my word for it. This is stuff that we all should be doing, brothers and sisters in Christ, and I encourage you to do word studies, uh, subject studies, um, that you look at, like, one of the words I like to do uh, here in the future is anger, and go through the Bible on every situation where anger comes into play. Someone lost their temper, whether God was, was provoked to anger, like we read, or man was provoked to anger, you know? Just looking up and going through the whole word of anger to help teach us that we should be slow to anger and do our best not to be angry, especially with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're not to be angry with neighbors, our neighbor. And we're to preach the gospel with love and patience and peace, not with anger. So thank you for watching and sticking with uh, the ministry this far in the word study of repent slash repentance. And I will see you in the New Testament. It's... Like I said, I'm just really excited about getting there, and I hope you are too. And I want to say peace, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Today is getting tough. I'll be coming out with another video shortly showing some things. Um, me watching another video, uh, stopping here, and they're showing some things that are going on overseas that someone showed me, and it's very... Shocking. I don't really keep up what's going on in the world. I have brothers out there that do that and they have websites where they do show what's going on in the world as far as prophecy and I don't really keep up with that much, but this video was pretty neat. I really want to get into it. So I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep praying for me and my wife and we pray for the brethren out there all the time. And these are, we are in the last days. We are definitely in the last days. I will see you in the next word study of repent slash repentance.